The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, this is Pete Mitchell. And this is Peyton Jones. With tweeting birds in the background. Can you hear that? Oh, my gosh. Can you can you hear the nail gun? Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, I can hear Yeah, that. there's a nail gun, and uh, there'll be buzz saws in a little bit. And We just had a bunch of lumber dropped off, so there was the doot, 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 and all the hydraulics. And it's been, been kind of... Kind of busy. You can probably hear this all there. Apparently, so working I'm on your house. Around. Apparently, working on your house is yeah. essential. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, my house is essential. <laughs> you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, no Everything kidding. Everything that's right? essential to us. It's like, yeah. And then if it's not for us, then we're like, oh, what are you doing over there? How, how dare you leave your house? How dare you go out? Well, so. It's funny because I think I think the patience of the American people is wearing thin. I think that's beginning to show. And I think that people are starting to say, hey, if all the data is not matching up, what's going on? And people are starting to, you know, words like civil disobedience are starting to kind of be floated around a little more commonly, which, if you remember, was um, Martin Luther King Jr. That's called civil disobedience. When people rise up and say, this is wrong, this is unjust, people's lives are being destroyed, and we're going to make a stand for this. So uh, the media tries to portray it as it's all a bunch of you know MAGA hat wearing rednecks that uh, have no high school education and just don't believe in science. But it's actually just hardworking Americans that are saying, we want to work, let us work. That's well, kind of it's not just we want to work, it's... We have to work. We need to. Yeah. Yeah. And and I've been saying this on two other podcasts since the beginning. The the absolute destruction to people's lives over what we now know is statistically, it's not as big of a deal as they made it out to be. Like it's it's basically slightly worse than the flu as far as death rate. Um, now I, I imagine, understand if you get scare. it, it sucks. I understand. That's the thing. Yeah. If yeah. you get it, it sucks. 96% of the people are going to be fine. The other 4% are really going to suck, might have to go to the hospital and a certain portion of them are going to die. Most of them already had pre existing conditions. I get it. It sucks. There's no two ways around it, but that's kind of what happens anytime you get sick. I mean, right. You, you have an immune compromised condition. You don't want to get anything. Not just COVID-19, right. but literally anything you want to stay away from it. Right. But the, right. the hysteria and then the absolute destruction, like um, I, I literally cannot believe what some of these people are doing. Some of these quote unquote cops. And I put that in quotes because, man, they are not serving and protecting at all. But there was an article, uh, I believe it was in Texas. I, I could be wrong on that. It's two young gals, a 30-year-old and a 20-year-old. We're doing uh, nails, and, nails and hair at their home because they needed to right. pay rent. I saw that. And it's like that an undercover cop goes and arrests them for working at their home. Like, this is not, but, this but is what nothing is the to do. Law? There's no law, right? I mean, well, they, they, there's actually no. There are so many ways that they can spin it because there are so many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of laws. You know, they right. can get you for something. It doesn't matter if what you did actually broke a law. They'll find something. And that's unfortunate. I mean, there have been books written on this that the average American commits three felonies a day and doesn't even know it. Right. Because right. They, they literally just write laws. So if they have to, they can go nail you for something. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. I've been living in a bubble. Well, so, it's, part of know, that, honestly, is because you're not a minority. Like, you want to know who really gets nailed by this crap? It's minorities and poor people. Yeah. 
because right. I mean, it's open season on them. It, right. uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just the facts. Yeah, no, I could see that. I mean, there, there is definitely a, a different justice system for uh, whites and non-whites for sure. Yeah. I mean, that, the that, haves and the have nots. You know, I mean, that's really what Absolutely. it comes down to more than more than even, I think, black and white or national or ethnicity, yeah. I should say. It, it really is the haves versus the have nots. If you have resources, um, you probably dress a certain way. You probably look a certain way. And that yeah, that gets you out of a lot of situations. Um, it's funny yeah. because uh, and, and this is, guys, this isn't the, the actual place that Peyton wanted to go with this podcast. But, man, I've, I've already no, gotten no, into real, it. real quick. Real quick. Hold hold that. Let's tell yeah. them what the, what yeah, the title is. Go today. for it. Go for it. The, ti- the title today, guys, our, our whole thing is for the church where, you know, obviously we do smack talk. And um, I, I was saying to Pete earlier, I was late to the or we were late to the party. Pete goes, you were late to the party. So as I've been out writing this book. Um, I've not been around to really speak into this. And so what we want to do today is talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are, and where we need to go as a church. And uh, and that's what we're going to do today. But Pete, continue. No, I was just going to say a, a good example of looking a certain way and people treating you a certain way. Where I live, um, one of our local cities has uh, passed a I don't know if it's a law, an edict, a rule, whatever, because it's a city, it's not county or whatever, that you have to wear a mask to go into any store. Uh, to, to If you're an essential employee, you have to wear a mask, and if you go into basically the grocery store. So where we live, we have to, that's where we shop is in that city because that's those are our local shopping uh, stores. And so right. I won't wear a mask. I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it's absolutely ridiculous. The science has already shown it doesn't do a thing. It's just this perpetuating this false sense of security out there for people. So I won't wear one. So they won't let me into the store. So what I found is uh, I do the bandana thing and I put the bandana around my neck, not around my mouth. Right. It's around my neck. And literally no one hassles me and I can go right into the store. And Jamie goes, I think it's the way you look. And it's true because the way I walk in there is like, you want a piece of me? You want a piece of me? And everyone just (laughs) lets me go. And literally to this day, no one has said a word to me. But if I didn't have the bandana around my neck, then they would. It's so funny. It's like, it's not, it's around my neck of all places. But it's, again, it's that perceived, well, he looks a certain way. He looks like, you know, he might give us trouble. Just let him go. Who, Who really cares? Just let him go. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I wear it, and uh, but I'm starting to now feel like, yeah, you know, we're kind of uh, we're kind of probably in a place, and I know people are the, the panic still abounds. Like, no man, you're gonna damn us all, you know, you're gonna doom us. Don't uh, don't lighten up. And and the reality is, it's kind of like, look, we were trying not to overload the healthcare system at work. And then people try to fear monger. No, but we will. You know, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Pete and I know people who work in, I'm sure you do too, um, listeners who work in the, in the hospitals. Um, two people I'm connected with have said, there's no one there. That the hospitals are, that one person just that I know got furloughed. That's several of them that I know. Acquaintance we have. Yeah, several of them and, that I know. And another one, another friend of mine just got laid off who's been at this hospital for years there's just, they can't pay because nobody's checking in. They've pretty much limited all healthcare right now. Um, and so if you can't do something via video, they've canceled all appointments. Well, you know, people forget that hospitals are not a charity. They're a business. So also our healthcare system is also being crippled right now. And, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theory person. I, it's not my, but you know, when you look at how much is getting crippled right now, it, it is scary to think that the government has it. We all know the government's always had this power. It just doesn't exercise it. But this is the power that the government has to bring everything to its knees. And so what, what you're able to do, what, what happened after World War II, both in Japan and Germany, is you're able to literally write a blank check for whatever you try to build next. 
And it feels to me like there's a reset button that's being pushed right now. And I, like I said, I'm not into conspiracy theories. I'm just looking at the effects going, huh, if I wanted to reset everything, this is exactly what I would do. Yeah, it's 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 scary on so many levels. And the other thing, too, is, I mean, I've gotten into this with with uh, several different pastors online and um, and because, you know, who I'm connected with online and and, and I'm I'm not I'm not in any way. Um, quiet on this issue. <laughs> Anybody who sees right. my Facebook, because to me, this is like, I'm, I'm looking for my, my kids. I'm looking at them going, this is not the world I want them living in at all. Right. And, and, and I hear of so many people who are losing everything, everything. I mean, my wife's been laid off. Her industry is not coming back when this thing is done. She's an ice skating right. coach. People aren't going to start ice skating again after this. First of all, they're not going to have the money and secondly, right. there's this fear, this huge fear that's out there. They're not going to go back into public places like that. So her right. industry right. is a year to two years away from coming back. I mean, it, it's like, it, and I'm looking at that going, okay, but we're still in a, a, an okay spot. My business is still moving along. I mean, it's, it's totally down because all my clients can't go to work. I mean, so it has this right. huge ripple effect that goes through everything. And then when I see people out there going, well, Romans 13, Romans 13, we, we must obey our, our, our overlords. And I'm like, no, okay, if you're really going to fo follow Romans 13, then you follow the law that God's given our land, which is the Constitution. They're not following it. So we have to fight back right. against that if we're going to follow Romans 13. I mean, but there's so much fear out there. And it's the fear that's driving right. everyone's decisions. And I get it. I mean, I get it. It's scary when you don't, you can't see this enemy. You can't feel this enemy. And literally every time you turn on the news, it's somebody telling you how bad this enemy is. There's huge fear. Right. It's unbelievable fear. And, and I get it. But right. at some point we have to just buckle up and go, all right, well, that fear needs to be put into check because there are people who are not able to feed their kids. They're not able to right. put a roof over their kid's head. And you're going to tell me that your fear trumps them. It doesn't. It doesn't right. even remotely trump them. Love your neighbor. Right. If you're fearful, stay home. Nothing your neighbor right. does is going to affect you if you stay home. Well, I think, I think when the church talks about social justice, and it's quite trendy. I, I heard Tim Keller the other day. He made a really good point. He said, you know, uh, train. You get it loud and clear today. I really he's, hope you're getting like double ply windows when you redo your home because, man, <laughs> you're trying. I, I for sure am. I for sure am. And, uh, but I love, did you hear how he's composing a, a musical tune there? He's, he's putting some artistic flair into that nice, one. Nice. <laughs> nice. Did you hear it? No, no. It was pretty funny. So, anyways, um, yeah. So, you know, going back to Tim Keller, um, got to sit in on the Q conference the other day and he made a very profound statement. It was, it was very, um, how do I put it? Uh, it was an indicting statement. Let's put it this way. He, he said, um, many of the younger ministers coming up right now are speaking about social justice. And by the way, he's all for social justice with the gospel, but he goes, they're, they're speaking up about social justice issues, but selectively mm. he goes, because he goes, they're not brave enough. They lack the courage to stand for all of the social justice issues. He said, like abortion. And he started listing off a couple things that if it's not PC, the leaders of today do not speak up for it. There's, we've lost this prophetic sense. And this is coming from Tim Keller, who is very intelligent. He's not a MAGA hat wearer, you know, but he's saying, look, if you really want to think of yourself as, you know, the advocate of social justice, then you have to speak up. You, you will alienate people for sure. The gospel, by the way, alienates people. Jesus said, I came to bring a sword in division. And I know that, you know, we're, we're not looking to, to divide the body of Christ. The body of Christ right now is dividing over secular issues. 
you know, in the early church, they were dividing over Jew Gentile and they were dividing over things like food sacrifice to idols. But those were theological issues. The church today is dividing over non-theological issues. And the interesting thing about what Keller brought out is he basically said, you know, if, um, you know, when it comes to social justice, you can't be selective if you're going to truly stand for social justice. And the reason I bring that up is because what you're saying, Pete, is a social justice issue. You're actually speaking, even though the media wants to spin it as something else, you're speaking up for hardworking families that are losing their jobs. Some are committing suicide. Like this is, this is devastating people. Yeah. And it is a social justice issue. It is. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, on one hand, it's like, I, I look at this stuff and I really, I ask myself, okay, what is God's plan in all of this? Because right. like you said, it's almost like we're seeing a giant reset button being pushed. And obviously there are people who are always going to take advantage of every situation they can, right? You know, the, the old saying, never let a, a tragedy sure. go to waste. I mean, there's always, and especially politicians, and I don't trust either right. side. Um, honestly, no. I, I believe they're both, they're both criminal, evil. dude. Yeah, exactly. Dude, the way they both padded the, the funding for the, the, the crisis the quote unquote, you know, stimulus, uh, emergency. No, it, it was wrong. What happened was wrong. They stole from the American people. I, I I'm telling people, Hey, we're paying for that. Just so you know, you're going to see that in your tax, uh, payments in future. That's not free money. You will pay for that over the, the next week. Probably the rest of our lives will be paying. And the taxes will go up like never before. And this was an excuse to get them up there. Yep. Yeah. And, um, but at the same time, it's like, okay, God, first of all, it's not a surprise to God. God knew what was coming. Right. right. God knows what's coming still down the path that we can't see yet. And I sit there and I go, I wonder what God's plan is in all of this. Like, how is he going to use this to draw more people to him? Because you know he will. You know he will. Right. More people are going to get reached. Right. I, I, I'm just curious. Like, I'm, I'm half I watch it as a spectator going, man, I'm really curious as to what's going to come down with all of this. Right. I don't know. Well, you know, and you got, you got people divided even on this right now. Um, some people are going to say, oh, you know, we still need to social. I'm all cool for social distancing. I'm all cool for doing all that. But I, I guess for me, like when I look at the church, even I kind of think, you know, like there's a, there's a point at which you're, you're posturing as a servant, but when they tell us that we can go to the supermarket and obey rules, then churches should be allowed that same uh, ability to yeah, gather there's, together there's, for there's, worship. There's no way distance. there's no way you can tell me that a church is less safe than the grocery store when you literally send a hundred percent of the people into the grocery store and the church right. doesn't right. even have ten percent coming into it. You know, so right. it's like right. this this does not even pass the smell test at all, which you know to me again it comes back to this is a direct violation of the first amendment. Um the uh, the protests that they're stopping people from doing and they're arresting people is a direct violation of the First Amendment. Uh, and I look at that and I'm like, okay, there's something sinister going on here. There's something evil going on. Well, churches on. are dangerous, my friend. Churches well, yeah, are dangerous. Absolutely. If, if you study history, the, um, the American Revolution was largely, uh, historians will agree, largely started in the church. Um, the churches were the ones that, you know, particularly preachers, which is why... <laughs> The founding father said, look, there needs to be a separation of church and state. That's why they said you can't politically lobby because they realized the power of the pulpit even back then. Had it not been for preachers back then who started saying, hey, we need to rise up. Well, that's not, the American entirely, Revolution that's not, not entirely accurate to history. So, you know, be a little bit careful there when you say that, because that wasn't there was no separation of church and state. That didn't come around until the 1900s when a Supreme Court decided for the first time ever to like, you, you got to understand our Supreme Court used to decide every decision and they'd also quote the Bible prior to, I think it was 19, uh, I'll mess it up. So I don't remember exactly what it was. And then they said, no, there's a separation of church and state. And that's when it was created. So that was not what our forefathers had at all in mind. What they said was there can't well, I, be a, a, uh, 
a government sponsored. Yeah, exactly. You know, you have the freedom to choose whatever religion you want. That was what they intended, which is freedom. Like you have to be able to, you can't be forced to come to God because God doesn't force you to come to him. You have to be given that freedom to choose. This is what I want, or this is what I don't want. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying when I say separation church and state, what I'm saying is the, the actual religion. Um, yeah. not being a state religion because they understood that the, when the pulpit is owned by the state, it's, it's, you can't, you can't stop it. The, the, the church is probably the most powerful. So they wanted the institution of the church to be separate from the government. Right. And so, and, and part of that, you know, here, here's the thing is if, you know, our, our founding fathers are more concerned about tyranny than ever today, the pulpit is the media. Nobody, you know, they, they had newspapers, magazines, all that kind of stuff back then that circulated. Um, they had printing presses, but the, the media today is the pulpit. You can see how powerful that is. The secular pulpit is the media. So, it, you know, it, it, it's a propaganda machine and the church could easily become a propaganda machine. Now, I'm not saying it is. In its best, you've seen things like the civil rights movement. Where, you know, again, the church being the, the, the central figure of that um, actually mobilized um, the, the marginalized in America to actually cause a social revolution. Um, Charles Colson in the book, The Body, talks about the fall of the Berlin Wall and the overthrow of communism in the Eastern Bloc countries was largely due to the movement of the underground church. And so when you're talking about the power of the church, it's huge. One of the first things you would do is you would get rid of the church because it's something that unites people in a stronger bond than anything else, including being an American citizen. It is the number one most dangerous institution. Do do you think they actually uh, fear the church like that? Like, I'm just wondering because most of our politicians, they don't even, I I mean, like the church is... An afterthought, and, and for good reason. I mean, the church today is, I mean, it's disjointed, it's it, it infighting, it's, you know, it, it is hardly a, uh, yeah. a force that stands together. I wonder if they even think I don't about know, it man. Like I, I don't know. I, I think the church is a threat to some. You think? And not to others. Yeah, I do. I yeah. do. Could I be. think that the church is seen as a powerful <laughs> force politically. Um, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about, apart from like the religious right wing, mm-hmm. the church has this huge power of potential, right? Like it, it just, it is the thing that, that unites. Like if I, if I talk to you, let's just take it out of Christianity for a second. Let's talk about if America, if the number one religion in America were Islam. Now talk about, you know, the government and look at in, in any, any country in the world where Islam is the dominant religion. How much of a factor or force is that? that well, whole whole governmental regimes are overthrown because of that. So, so religion is a huge force, and I guess what I'm saying yeah, is, no, that's true. Do that's I true. believe that? Do I believe right now that the government is literally trying to shut down? The, like that's the agenda? No, I don't. But I do think that it's interesting that pot stores are open but churches are closed. Right. Liquor stores are open. Now, I know it's because of taxes. Right. They don't get taxes off the church. Um, but but you, you can't tax a nonprofit. It's it's not. A, these other things are how the government gets its money, pot stores, all that. But but my point is, at a certain point, the church kind of has to stand up and find its voice and say, you know, we're cool up to a point, but we have a right to worship now. We will cover up like we do at the supermarket. We will stay six feet apart. I would love to see churches starting to meet six feet apart. And and when I when I talk about civil disobedience, right, um, keep in mind that the American Revolution and the Civil Rights Movement were both cases of civil disobedience. Yeah. Because the church rose up and said enough. You know what, so I, what I also find my... what, I, what I also find interesting is uh, the American Revolution. There were many in the church who cried Romans thirteen. Then you know we we got to stick with King right. George Romans thirteen. Right. 
And I don't know this. Maybe you do because you're much more of a histori- uh, historian buff. But in the early days of Hitler, a pop, a pop historian, not yeah, not anything historian. sophisticated by any means. I, I wonder, did the same thing happen in the early days of Hitler with the church? Was everyone like, no, no, you know, yes, we're we're protecting sure. people. We're you know, it's safety. Yep. We're, I mean, because that was the whole thing with putting Jews in the camps. You know, yes. we got to look out for everyone. And I'm like, Man. well, the first thing that that Hitler did is he took over the church. He nationalized the church. So um, Bonhoeffer was a dissenter. Um, he came to America. Some of you probably know this. He came to America. Um, I, can't, I think it was to study. And after being here for about six months, he felt convicted like, this isn't right. I've escaped everything. And I have a duty. I have to go back into the thick of the storm and make a stand. And so perfect example is Bonhoeffer. Mm. Um, Oliver Cromwell, who was a, a, an English Puritan, who the same argument between, you know, Charles the first and who they beheaded, they overthrew uh, the monarchy, um, established parliament, but Cromwell was a very strong um, Christian and the Puritans, you know, again, they had a nationalized church, you know, still do. But at that time, everything was Catholic. And of course, they were Protestant. They were Calvinists. And they were like, hey, this isn't right. Like, if if God's going to be represented, the king is not, if he's a Catholic, this was according to them now, um, if he's a Catholic, he's not God's represent. God's being misrepresented. They felt it was it was a cult. I mean, the parents thought that the Pope was the Antichrist. So for them, even though, you know, we get really uncomfortable with emerging and I do as well. Like I, I haven't taken any of the stim- stimulus money because I feel mm, don't want the government in my nonprofit pocket, my religious pocket. That feels really dirty to me. And I, I, oh, I and I'm not judging you, any of you guys. I, I guarantee you it's a huge mistake for a church to take money from the government. Huge well, and I'm not judging mistake. any of you out there who did it. I understand. I get it. You got to pay your bills. I get it. But for me, I just, something's checking my spirit. And again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Please understand. I'm not saying here there's this big, you know, weird, you know, the reptilians of the, the, the flat earth society or, you know, nothing stupid. Hey, hey the I'm moon is saying, hollow. We found that out. The moon <laughs> is hollow. It's a space station, brother. And, and so here, here's the thing, right? <laughs> We're going to move to the principality of sea land. We're going to stake the, the ch- <laughs> but you know, going back to this, you know, wh- what I'm trying to say is even Cromwell had these arguments. People would say, Oh, the, you know, this is Romans 13. And, God. and Cromwell gave some brilliant arguments for why that wasn't the case. And so I think that we, it's been so beaten into our head that um, the church at its best never gets politically involved and the church at its worst has always been politically involved and it depends i would say the civil rights which read any historian on it it, it was it was a church movement it happened in the pulpits there's a reason the minister was at the center of it and that wasn't unique to montgomery alabama the fact is is that the church can be a great agent of social transformation of cultural revolution and it was then and it was based on scripture and it was based on it's when they took the constitution like the founding fathers who said hey we we consider that all men are created equal there was just the very creation of them that they appealed to a higher power than the king and that was god the god of the scripture so we have to remember that sometimes some of the best things happen. And, and, and I remember being in seminary class and they asked, you know, Hey, the, uh, they, 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 they talked about, you know, um, Constantine, Constantine pretty much just ex- <laughs> a lot of good happened with Constantine and a lot of bad happened with Constantine. And I remember my seminary professor, he proved, presented all of the pros and all of the cons. And at the end of it, he said, Constantine, good thing or bad thing, go. And man, I'm telling you, that was one of the most robust discussions we've ever had because there was no right or wrong answer. There was no black and white verdict. It was like, huh, there's a lot of good that came out of him and a lot of bad that came out of him. 
And so when you're saying, I just wonder what God, you know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm with you, Pete. I agree with Pete. (laughs) I haven't had one of those soundbite. I know, right? (laughs) And I said it sincerely. Did you hear that? (laughs) I heard it tongue in cheek, but that's all right. I'll take it any way I can get it. (laughs) Oh, that's rad. So, anyways. So how do you I'm think enjoying the church, this conversation. Right? How do you think the church should be responding? I believe right now that the church needs to be lobbying for its freedom. And I, and I think, kind of like how people are protesting, I now believe I'm starting to shift my view. I'm now starting to feel it's time for us now to be saying, we did what you asked. We served the community. We will continue to serve the community. But we will meet. We will meet six feet apart. We will meet with masks. We will have hand sanitizer. We will do everything you have asked to protect people, but we will meet. That's where I'm at right now. Right. Yeah. No, I definitely think. uh, And I wasn't there a week ago. I wasn't there a week ago. I got to tell you. Yeah, no, a week ago I was like, okay, we'll wait this out and just keep watching the the statistics and the reports and the figures because we still don't still don't know what we're dealing with and i'm starting to feel like yeah we know what we're dealing with now and well, uh i feel the really curve has proud been i feel really proud to be the the lone voice in the wilderness that's finally been proven right this is amazing <laughs> this is amazing well, this has always been in the back of my mind don't get me wrong like I, I i've always had this in the back of my mind but but part of me is starting to feel like okay um you know, like nobody wants to be the butthole that, that brings the disease and plague back on everybody. Like, and everybody's afraid of that. Everybody's afraid to be that. But I believe that when we get a little further down the line, um, let me put it this way. Almost everything I said on the Ministry Ninja podcast that I went, you know, if a lot, if millions of people die, I don't want this thing live. So I pulled that. I went to Barry and I said, hey, don't air that because I'm hearing different reports every day. And what I said at the beginning was very balanced. It was from a medical perspective. Right. And it was, well, you know, um, I just gave my insight. And it's funny because now when medical people are coming out and saying things, I'm like, okay, you know, that's good. That's good. That's, that's how a medical person thinks about this. But the reality is brother, now I'm looking back going, what was right. And and if, and if I had a time machine, uh, my, my prediction would be, um, there's going to come a time where people are going to say, we wished we had stood up sooner and said more sooner because right now, like they opened our beaches a few days ago. Three the governor's going to close them, by the now way. Now they've shut them. The, the, yeah, the governor yeah, is, shut them again. The governor is going to, he's basically going to issue an order to close all the beaches and state parks in California. Right. Because people are violating right. his order and he is so bent out of shape about that. Right. Right. And it's, and it's really not about that. You know, the, the, the fact is, is that we are happy as a people to protect one another. We are happy as a people to, um, to not infect people. And I, and I think if we follow the rules, all is well. But, yeah, I'm, I'm in the camp right now where the church needs to meet. I just heard a mic drop. I don't know if you heard it, but I heard a mic drop. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side, my friend. We've been missing you. <laughs> I felt like yeah. I was the only one. I thought I was alone in the world. No, it's just no, no. I get it. You know, I don't know. I I look at everything that's uh, that's going down, and um, I don't I don't know what's coming because you have it, it, it really what it feels like is here in California, at least it feels like the governor is so bent out of shape that people are defying him, that he keeps extending things and making it worse. I mean, basically saying Whoa. it's going to be months, maybe a year before churches can reopen. Right. Um, no. And it's the uncertainty that people, if we had a very clear, like if he said, look, September, everything will be open again. People would say, okay. Yeah, but I, I don't think so because you can't, you, can't, you can't survive that long. Like 
Here's the thing that these no, politicians get don't get because they haven't worked in the real world, many of them ever in their lives, or it was so long ago where they were an employee and they never understood like running a business. I was watching the, the news, uh, I think it was last night, and they interviewed this gal who had a high-end restaurant in uh, LA. And, you know, she was talking about, well, yeah, they're telling us we have to social distance in the restaurant six feet apart from each other. She's like, but that doesn't work. That means I can only put 30% right. of the people in here. And she goes, they don't charge me less for my meat. They don't charge me less for my rent. The only way I make this thing work is to pack my restaurant. This doesn't work. Right. And they right. either don't get it, they don't care, or they don't, they don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't know what it is, but they are literally deliberately making decisions that are going to adversely affect millions upon millions of lives. Like I've said this right. on the other podcast that I do. We're we're entering into a depression worse than the Great Depression. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It is not we are not going to get out of this without serious pain because you cannot right. take that many people out of the workforce right. and then just go, "Oh, everything's going to be okay." They they can still somehow right. feed themselves because we've got food banks. They can somehow pay their rent. How they can't pay their rent. They can't pay their mortgage. What do you think is going to happen? It, it doesn't right. work. The system doesn't work unless you let us live our lives and take our risks. Right. If you're afraid, stay home. I get it. Stay home. Right. But you have well, to let to everyone that else We live. would isolate the sick. This is the first disease ever where we've isolated yep. the healthy. This has yep. never happened before. So this some somehow somebody came up with a... a, a what's um, uh, a solution that was a first time ever. It's not that we've had a first time ever disease. that's wreaked havoc on humanity. This is the first time we've dealt with it this way. And, you know, arguably some would say it worked. I mean, look, you know, nothing happened, but again, that's being called into question. My prediction was that over time that data would present because our, our biggest problem in the beginning was a lack of data. Yeah, and I'm, sure. I was totally happy in the lack of data because that's a two edged sword. Always you want to err on the side of caution. So I was in support of that. Like, Hey, let's err on the side of caution in case it is the big boogeyman. Everybody thinks it is. But now that we're starting to get the idea that it's not right um, to, to continue on with the charade is a farce. And so you know, and that's where I think the, the American people, their patience is wearing thin. And they're starting to say, look, we knew sacrifices would come, but hey, what's a job compared to your life, right? Like, okay, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do anything. Like Job says, you know, to save my skin, you can take everything from a man, but, you know, he, he still has a skin. And so God goes, well, yeah, you can go mess with his, his body now. But, but, you know, the reality is, is we're in a place where now, um, we, we've got to start thinking about, you know, kind of like you're saying about the, uh, the economic devastation, we've got to start thinking now about the pastoral issues. You know, if, if people can't get to the church, um, and the church can't get to people like that's my biggest concern, by the way, I've never been a four, four walls kind of church guy. You know that about me. Um, my biggest concern is we can't get to people who need us. Mm. Does that make sense? Almost yeah. everything that I want to tell the church they need to do during this time, I can't tell them. I, I can't tell them to go do these things because they can't. There's a stay at home order. <laughs> they can go grocery shopping. They can buy pot. They can buy alcohol, but they can't do, they can't even go over to their neighbor's house. If someone calls the cops on you for going, they will come out and talk to you. I just saw a video from Wisconsin where cops were, were over there starting to bust someone because their kids went next door to play with the neighbor's kids. They had masks on, you know, but, but that isolation creeps in, you know, so, uh, you know, we're in a weird it's, place. Man. It's having a huge devastation on kids like that. It scares me for the future generations, you know, um, the yeah. way that Jamie and I are, 
Our, our kids basically right now think it's kind of like summer vacation, right? Because right. we, we take them to the park every day. Um, when we find another family that's not, you know, living in fear, we're like, dude, you want your kids to play with ours? Come over. We don't care. And they do. And, and if the cops showed up for me, I'd be like, get out of here. We don't talk to cops. Go. It's called the Fifth right. Amendment. Leave. Right. Get off my property. I would not talk to them one bit. I would make them leave. And I would be willing right. to go to jail for that, by the way, because right. this is absurd. Yeah. We've reached a level of absurdity in the world. But I look at Luke's friends, especially, right? Because his, his group is the eight-year-olds, right? So they're older than Mackenzie, who's the five-year-olds who were... In her case, she right. was TK. I mean, they were still so young. Um, his best friend, man, I feel for this kid because the family is just freaked out. And right. the mom is an anesthesiologist, so she's in the hospital. So she's got that extra pressure, right, of daily updates on here's what Corona is doing and blah, 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 blah. So she has brought that home and is, you know, fair, is scared for her family is the words that she told Jamie. And I get it. The fear is real. But I look at this poor kid and I'm like, man, like we drove our bikes, uh, or drove, we rode our bikes by his house and he just looks so sad because, you know, he couldn't come out. And it was like, man, what is this doing to these poor kids? And um, one time they're at the park, you know, Luke, Mackenzie, uh, you know, one of the other kids in the neighborhood who, you know, the parents are like, whatever, this is all crazy. And the, the kids are all playing. And then, you know, there comes his best friend walking with his mom with the masks on and not able to go play with the kids because she's too afraid. And it's like, what is that going to do to these poor kids, man? I mean, what's going to happen to this future generation? I don't know. I don't know. Like the long-term effects of this, what it's going to be, but we're in for a bumpy ride ahead for sure. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's like I said, I, I I think that people are going to, there's a lot to this. There's a social, social justice aspect. There's a, um, you know, the, the churches needing to be advocates for the worship of God kind of almost making a prophetic saying, if you look at the prophets in the Old Testament, um, they stood up when the kings were like, you know, they, people call it nowadays, speaking truth to power. That's the phrase. But saying, hey, look, we'll, we're not going to make anybody sick. We'll obey the rules that the doctors, the medical people will, will, will function under the guidelines of the experts that you're allowing other businesses to operate under. But we need to meet. And, and I just think being an advocate for people um, who are going to need worship, I actually believe right now people are more open to the gospel than ever before. Really? And so I, I, I do. I mean, the people I'm in touch with right now, like, brother, I got to tell you, like, you know, because I got building going on, I'm sharing the gospel all the time with the guys on my job site. And um, I'm, a lot of my friends that are, that are ministers are leading people to Christ. Mm. And just, just, you know, like, like Paul Percy the other day, yeah. um, I'll, I'll mention his name, you know, he was, uh, Paul's, Paul's like a, a hair's breadth from leading his own manager to Christ and has been for months having ongoing conversations. <laughs> the other day they sent him out to another store for a day because the guy's just like a rising star. He works so hard and he's, they love him, right? Like he went to upper management pretty quick and uh, he's one of our church planners in new breed network. And, um, Planted and Stan, we've mentioned him before. And, uh, but anyways, he, he, he went over for a day and he led this guy to Christ. And there's just a receptivity right now. You know, as much as we're, we're talking about this, and things are unsettled. Um, people are starting to ask the bigger questions right now. And, you know, I, I think it's a really opportune time. So part of me, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm an advocate right now for the gospel. I think that the gospel needs not, not that meeting in a church building will do it. Don't get me wrong on this. Like I said, I'm more concerned that we can't go to them than they can come to us. You, you, you follow me on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but I know we didn't get to our topic, which is often, right? Like sometimes smack talk bleeds so far in, but, but hopefully this will frame the conversation we're going to have over the next few weeks, because maybe, maybe we get this stuff out of the way right now. And next week we come back and we talk about, okay, this is where we've been. This is where we are. This is where we're going. 
Yeah. Because I think we can build on this. But uh, you're hearing the opinions of two guys, by the way. Pete and I never think. And, and, hey, and like if, I said, my opinion just with changed us, this week. If you disagree with us, you're wrong. That's all. That's all they need well, to know. Well, my opinion might change again in the next week. You know, I mean, that's been the, well, the really strange thing about that. This. That could be for you, but I can guarantee you my opinion pretty much isn't going to change. Like, I believe that we need to have the freedom to self-isolate. You don't force it on people. And right. I mean, to me, that's what the, I don't have a problem at all with people self-isolating, staying, you know, in their home, go for it. Right. It's kind of, to me, it's the same thing with guns. I like guns. I have fun shooting. I don't care if someone else doesn't like guns. I was talking with uh, someone from uh, refuge long beach. I think it was last week. And I know how he feels about guns. And, uh, and I'm like, dude, I don't have a problem with you not liking guns. Like, I think that's cool. That's to me, that's freedom. You have the freedom to not like guns, to not have guns, to not shoot guns. I'm totally cool with that. And the same thing with staying right. home. I'm totally cool if you want to stay home, but you don't get to force that on someone else. Your sense of security, right. which is a false sense of security, by the way, does not entitle you to force it on someone else. If someone else wants to go to work, take the risk possibly get sick that's on them and they have the right to do that and that's all there is to it as far as i'm concerned they have the right to do it people have the right to make bad choices whatever that choice might be now i don't personally think it's a bad choice to leave your house i do it every day i do it every chance i can i don't wear a mask right i do the bandana around the neck and that seems to get everyone off my case um that's that's my choice and if I get sick and if I die, it was my choice. And I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay right. with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I do. So while you're doing Look, all this self-isolation, um, uh, Peyton. I was just going there. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, while you're doing all this gonna, self-isolation, I was going to bring guns into it for you. Who, who's, <laughs> go, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, who's who's helping you with you know? Because you can't get into your church. Who's helping you with payroll and you know that IRS compliance? And I don't even know if you're able to get tithe right now. But if you were, who would be helping you with all that? Well, Pete, because I'm a parrot and I like to just trendily say things that other leaders are saying. It's the new normal. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Not, not like the church didn't go back to normal after. I mean, I hope it doesn't go back to normal. Don't get me wrong, but I hope it just gets out of the building more. But um, it, not like after the Spanish flu, like it ruined the church forever or anything, you know? Um, yeah, we must remember history that that happened. Um, <laughs> I don't know enough about that. So I, just, I can't I, wait to hear that story. Well, well you know, when the last time we had this major flu uh, epidemic, um, the church just went back to meeting as normal. So anyways, but, but, but all that to say, apparently these, these new leaders know that, you know, there's a new normal and maybe it's because we have the magical internet, but anyways, um, well, Pete, uh, I screwed up our commercial again. Dang it. Um, really? Like, okay, like, uh, like they would expect anything <laughs> else from us. I know. I know. They don't even bother anymore. Uh, Peyton and Pete still doing that commercial. I, I don't know. I who don't knows? care. Who knows? That's what they're thinking right now. Yeah. Who knows? So anyways, um, simplifychurch.com, Pete, that will meet all of your new normal church needs, including <laughs> keeping um, payroll, uh, you know, even reaching out to the government for a Oh, gosh. <laughs> Gotta stop. Somebody stop me. Uh, SimplifiedChurch.com. Nice. A little salty today. A little salty today. Oh, dear. I, I live my life. Well, here's the thing for me, man. <laughs> I wake up in the morning. I sleep with my cell phone right by my, my bed. I go into the, the bathroom to, uh, to take my shower. And as I'm doing my morning constitutional, I'm checking Facebook. And I started getting into it like literally at 7 a.m. with my mom on Facebook. Like, oh no, public, you know. And I told Jamie that she's like, no, already. And I'm like, yes, I was busting out the whole, you know, not everyone's oh, no. got their home paid off and has a pension. And, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, 
<laughs> like, oh, dude. So I've been salty like every day since March 15th or whenever this stupid thing started. Treat her right. Treat your mother right. Oh, my gosh. Mr. T, I'm going to bust him out. It's Mother's Day coming. You know, it's time. It's going to make the rounds on Facebook. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, hey, guys, this has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell on the Church Planner Podcast reminding you, if you want to reach ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going. Uh, and live stream. That live stream where nobody's live streaming. <laughs> yeah, live stream like nobody's live streaming. <laughs> Oh, da holly ding ding diddly. Did you uh did you did you stop recording? No, you gotta do you gotta do the uh the Ned Flanders. Oh. Do do Ned Flanders. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. Uh oh, how's he go? Um, how does he do it? Uh ding diddly ding diddly, gotta be nice. I diddly diddly. Uh <laughs> they did their best. Shadly diddly. Oh diggity ding dong hell crap. <laughs> 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 that whole thing memorized. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. We'll, we'll be back when we're back. We'll talk to you then. Take care. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Church Planner Magazine.